my YouTube channel. My name's Janelle McKay and I'm from Emmeline Bags and I've designed this new pattern, the Wild Rose Shoulder Bag. You can make this bag as a crossbody bag or a shoulder bag and today I'm going to walk you through all the steps on how to sew this yourself. First, I'm just going to show you a few of the cool features it has. I designed this pattern for myself um, for a bag that I wanted to carry. I like a smaller bag. I don't like anything too bulky because then I just put way too much stuff in it. And this is the size that I find a lot of my customers are asking for. They want something a little smaller than the Aspen, a little bigger than some of the smaller little sling bags. And this actually holds quite a lot. It's got a, a gusset that is um, pie wedge like this. So it comes out quite a lot at the bottom, but it still has kind of a nice shape that hugs your body, which I love. Um, you can make it in a solid version or you can really have fun with it and mix and match and do some accent fabrics in here or on the strap or even the back pockets you could do in different colors. You could do the front pattern pocket a different color. You really can do a lot of fun things with this bag. This bag has a ton of pockets. On the back it has a slip pocket with a magnetic snap to hold, I mean, your phone or anything back there. And then if you flip up the two front flaps, there is a matching pocket in here, and this one is kept secure with the snap that holds the flaps down. The whole flap section, the two flaps, fold over as one, and that keeps everything in here secure, but also keeps your stuff in the center compartment open, or sorry, secure as well. So I've got stuff with paper, but it's a pretty big bag. You can fit a lot of stuff in here. So the two flap sections operate as one, and fold over at the top. But if you fold them up, you can pull this apart and inside is the center of your bag and there is a zipper pocket here that goes down into the bag cavity. Now this is actually the spot where we're gonna turn the bag to, so the lining actually is sewn to fit quite snugly in the bottom of the bag. In the material requirements, I don't mention using interfacing on the faux leather. But if you want something a little bit more structured, you're welcome to do so. Um, I know a lot of us do like to use interfacing on faux leather, and for that you could use the EB Fuse Light or EB Fuse Medium. The faux leather itself, although it has structure, it can stretch a bit, so sometimes interfacing is great. But I have it included in the pattern instructions because I know some of us have domestic machines and we really want to make sure that we're sewing with as few layers as possible. So we're gonna go, go through and sew this bag in the video today. And I'm also gonna show a few tips and tricks on how to sew the faux leather straps and deal with the faux leather process. And I hope you have a lot of fun sewing with me today. I recommend actually that you watch the video through and then as you're sewing, keep your instructions beside you and refer to them. Use the video as a guideline to help you through the sewing process, and I think you'll have a lot of fun with this. It's got a lot of interesting characteristics, and um, in the beginning, it just you're thinking like, how is this bag going together? It just seems kind of weird. Because of these two strap anchor features that I didn't even mention yet, the anchors themselves are attached and hit inside the pocket, so you don't have these ends of the strap anchor shown. They're anchored in here, and so when you're putting the bag together, you've got a front section and a back, back section that are actually joined by these two anchors. So yeah, stick with it and it'll all come together in the end. Stay organized with your fabric and interfacing pieces and your magnetic snaps because there are three magnetic snaps and that means there's six different snap halves to put in and the snap halves have to be put in in a way that we make sure that they can actually close so we want to make sure that there's one side here and here that match up and close it so follow along have a lot of fun with it and i can't wait to see your makes so i'm going to pull out my pattern and let's get started sewing okay let's just jump right into the material recommendations there are two views View A, which is where you have all of the exterior fabric in one color. It's all in the same fabric, whether it is a quilting cotton, which I recommend for beginner sewers, or someone who doesn't have a heavy duty sewing machine, or a faux leather. And both of our faux leathers that we sell 
at Emmeline, whether it's the Rex or the Mora, can be used if you know that you've used these before on your sewing machine and you've had good success, then they can be used with this bag. I just recommend if you have something else that it be a thin leather, something that's soft, or sorry, faux leather, not leather, and that um, you've worked with it before so you know that your sewing machine can handle it. So with view A, which is the exterior all the same, for quilting cottons that are 44 inches wide, you need one yard, and for the faux leather, we're saying half a yard because you're using a wider width, a uh, width that is 54 inches. Now view B comes into play where we're adding an accent fabric and that one was really popular with my pattern testers. So we're gonna make a bag like that today as well. So the accent fabric is this fabric right here. The second flap, the underneath flap, is in either a lighter or darker color as well as the strap anchors and the strap itself. Now, in my fabric requirements, I've said a half yard for the exterior fabric and a half yard for the exterior accent. There actually is enough in the accent half yard if you wanna do this under piece here too, and that is piece E. So if you wanna do piece E in to match this, that'd be kinda nice because then you wouldn't have two colors right here. It would be, the whole thing would be the same and you wouldn't have a little bit of fabric peeking out just on the edge here. So that's totally okay. If you wanna do E in the accent fabric, you can. Now, so for uh, lining fabric, I've recommended a quilting cotton type of fabric. Um, I have had a tester use our nylon pack cloth, cloth and that worked very well too. The, um, interfacing I've made a couple versions I've made it with our light interfacing I've used medium I've used heavy and I kind of feel like the medium or heavy are really nice for all the exterior fabrics and the light interfacing worked well on the lining too but so did the medium so just to keep things simple in the material list I've said medium weight interfacing lightweight interfacing would be your SF 101 which is the Pate Pelon Shape Flex or our Emmeline light interfacing. Medium is something that's just a little bit more structure. It's the same, it's woven cotton, and it's a little heavier. I love Pelon Thermal Lamb Plus Fusible Fleece, and I've got some of that here. It's a dense fleece, a little bit like a felt, and um, they have changed this recently or over the years. Used to be that you couldn't fuse directly onto it, you'd need to use a pressing cloth so that it wouldn't melt. So if you've noticed some changes in it, that's because it is actually okay to press directly on this now. So I think they've changed its makeup a, a little bit. It seems a bit thinner, but at the same time when you press it, it doesn't get thinner. Whereas the old stuff, when you pressed it, it lost its thickness anyway, and it did compress. So this one is quite nice the the glues in it combined with the interfacing add a nice stiffness to the outside of the bag now we can also fuse that directly onto the faux leather so wherever we ask for fusible fleece for the faux leather you can do that with our faux leather um, that we sell as well and I'm just putting fusible fleece on the outside of the flap not the underside same with this one not under here because it will wrinkle in here and bubble a bit. It just adds too much bulk in here. So I like to have it on this outer piece only and then on the exterior parts of the bag. Now, I do have a little bit of a legend here at the bottom so you can see where the pattern pieces are. So if you wanna change them up a bit, if you want to use different fabrics, you know, say you have five or six fabrics or four fabrics, you can have a bit of an idea of where they go. So what we've got when we're looking at it front on is A is this piece here, B is this accent piece down here, and C is here. Now if I open this up, you're going to see, okay, and now I have to open that too to match the picture. D is under here, B is here, and C. And then inside of here, you can see this lining. That is your H. 
fabric, the lining. Lift that up. The underneath of here is E. E. This is C pocket. And then in here, you'll have G and C as well. So G is the lining, which is the bottom half of the outer shell. And C is just like this piece. You're gonna cut several of the same size. You'll cut two outers and two inners because it makes its lining with the uh, lining C. Flip it to the back, same thing. C, C, and G. I hope that makes sense. There's a lot of letters there. We'll just move on to the bag hardware. At Emmeline, we do sell kits, and the bag hardware kits have everything you need in them on the list, unless you're using a faux leather for the strap. For the faux leather strap, you need something that's a little bit wider to accommodate those thicknesses. So we do sell a wide mouth strap slider, which just means that this gap in here is wider so that you can get the thickness of faux leather into there. So that is something you might wanna add. You need your rotary cutter, cutting mat, and a ruler. Um, for the snaps, we use um, a nice clear drying glue. You could use Fabri-Tac or you could use E6000. I like to use E6000 in our shop because when we ship it, it's non-flammable, but basically it's about the same as the Beacon 3-in-1, but it's a non-flammable, that's hard to say, a non-flammable version. Now, be creative tape. Oh, where's that tape? Okay, let's see. I have a double-sided tape that I absolutely love. It is a thin three millimeter or one eighth of an inch tape. And I use this on for my uh, zipper insertions because it's really quite sticky. And if you had a wider version of it, you really wouldn't want to sew through it. The wider versions are for putting on things like pockets or tabs or holding down seam allowances. But this thin version we can put on the very edge of the zipper and then when we sew it, we don't actually sew through the tape and it holds everything really nicely so it doesn't stretch out of shape. If you do have the wash away wonder tape in the quarter of an inch, that's non-tacky tape so you can actually, it doesn't stick quite as well but it does hold your stuff in place and you can sew through that so that's nice too. So just a few notes that I always have on my pattern before you get started. Your seam allowances are always in this little box. So if you ever forget what your seam allowance is, go back to this page. They are 3 8 of an inch or one centimeter for all of your main stitching, a quarter of an inch for attaching your zipper and for basting, and an eighth of an inch for top stitching or edge stitching, unless otherwise stated. There will be some spots where we might change that a bit based on the style of fabric you have or the type of fabric you have. We always backstitch the beginning and end of seams. And if you're a quilter like me, that's sort of hard to remember because I'm just used to just running off the fabric. And, and when you're bag making, you really need to do that back up and, and come forward again just to lock those threads in place. Now we have a lot of abbreviations in our pattern, RS, for the right side of fabric and WS for the wrong side of the fabric. And I have these in red throughout the pattern so that they won't be missed. Okay, now let's go ahead to the next step. Step one, cut the pieces. We're gonna have a look at our paper templates. Now, if you follow the directions on page one, it said to print two sets of these. Now I do have an alternate um, idea for this that I use quite a lot and that is to make plastic templates. And in that way, if you use that method, you don't actually need to print them twice. But first let me say that the reason why we need these smaller interfacing pieces is that when you're dealing with a lot of layers, we've got your fleece, your fabric and little pockets and gussets, it's really nice to have your interfacing not in your seam allowances because when you have your interfacing in the seam allowances, that's where you'll have a lot of trouble at different parts of the bag if it's too thick, like particularly intersections and Y seams where they all come together. And if you add interfacing in there, you're adding you know six layers. So it's nice to have those not in the seams. But, I mean, if you're using an industrial machine or, or if you uh, want to block fuse ahead of time, you certainly can, but be prepared that there might be an additional struggle. 
Um, okay, so this time I didn't print two sets of each one. What I did actually was print one set of all of my pattern pieces and then I cut them at the gray lines and did the overlapping just as instructed. So in here there are instructions on taping the gray areas over the other gray area next to it. And you can read those on your pattern piece. And what I do to make this super simple is I first trace on my template plastic. And this is just a, a very thin quilting template that you can get from quilting shops. We do sell it in the store, but not online, just because it's quite flimsy and uh, comes in a big, big thing and big pieces and it's kind of hard to ship, but literally you could go into any quilt shop and they really will have quilters template or template plastic. So put your plastic over top and then I just use a Sharpie and I go ahead and draw my outside lines on as well as any extra markings that I need. So one of the things I didn't write on this one is for directional print and I grabbed a pen that doesn't work. This is the top for directional fabrics and that you can just read it right there. And I didn't add that, but I will add my placement markings for my straps and my dots for my start and stops that I'll need later on. Also put in your center markings. Now I go ahead and then I make another set. So I put a template piece over top again and I trace out the dash lines and that's why I don't need to print these twice because I can just use the same set to make both sets of templates. And then I just make sure I write this is the fabric template and this is the one that's for interfacing and fleece. Okay, so if you go ahead and print all these, there's um, one page in particular that has measurements on it. So because this bag is just full of curves and it's all templates, it's all pattern pieces, and generally I don't make pattern pieces for any squares or rectangles because I prefer to use a method where we're using our rotary cutter and ruler for these because it's really fast and you don't need to mess around with paper. So I have provided some measurements for both the fabric and the interfacing on these template pieces. And so if you would rather just not use the paper, you don't have to. One of the things though I should show you is this, uh, sorry, this pocket facing, I do make because if I can find it, it's gonna be pretty handy to draw our zipper box later if we make a plastic template like this. So be really accurate in your lines here because this is going to be your zipper box that we transfer onto the back of the uh, facing. And what else do I have to say about templates? Um, just make sure you print them actual size. There is a box on A, and if you get your gridded ruler, that ruler should fit perfectly on the one inch line. If it's just even just a hair, a 30 second, too small or too big, you know that you've had some sizing. When you hop over to the cutting list, you will find there's three pages. So you only need to use one of these based on which method you're using. So view A are page three and five. So this would be view A if you're using a quilt and cotton on the outer and view A is the one that's all solid fabric, no accents, and view A, all solid fabrics, no accent if you're using faux leather that is 54 inches wide. Now, page four is if you're doing the accent, so it's got this column added in here for the accent fabric right here. So pay particular attention to whether this is folded fabric or open wide. For instance, this fabric here, the lining, says it's folded and um, the exterior is shown unfolded. So when you cut on a fold, you're cutting through two layers at once. So when you're cutting 2G, you, you're going to be cutting them both at the same time. So for F though, 
I have cut one only in f this direction and one only this direction. And this happens a little bit in my cutting list and that is because of directional prints. This is my F piece um, in my exterior fabric and I wanna cut one like this and one like this if I have a directional print because if I have um, a print that goes up this way with butterflies, you know, this way, when I look in my bag, we don't want one set upside down. So that's why I have them turned. But if you don't have directional fabric, do what I did, and I actually just cut these two at the same time. So just cut one template out on the double layer and you don't need to do it this way. And then on the interfacing, I have a couple pieces that are stacked. And the reason why they're stacked on the drawing is just to illustrate that you only need one of each and you can get one of each out of the one out of the top layer and one out of the bottom layer because this is a folded piece of interfacing if you're working with an interfacing that isn't 44 inches wide like our brand if it's only 20 inches wide you can fold it in half and cut through both layers at the same time now you don't need to worry about the direction of your pattern pieces on the interfacing. You can have like A and E both facing um, upwards if you want. Like it doesn't matter if they're like this or like this, it's interfacing. So that is, you just have to worry about that. When you're looking at your exterior fabric and your lining, you just wanna make sure that where it says top on your pattern piece, you're making sure that that is at the top of your directional print. One of the things I should mention is that if you're using faux leather, on page five, I have done the F pieces sideways because, I mean, I would hate for you to have to buy a whole yard of faux leather um, if it's not directional and you could just turn them sideways because faux leather is very forgiving that way. You can turn it sideways. So if you do need or directional orientation if you have a pattern or something on your faux leather you will need to buy a little bit extra and I have that written on the material list here okay so I'm jumping around a little bit but just make sure you read through all of the little tips that pertain to your particular page and the particular materials that you chose on your cutting list and then after you're done cutting them out, then we will move to interfacing and marking the templates. Okay, so we've made all of our template pieces and now we need to cut out our fabric using the charts. And I just use my template pieces, pieces these plastic ones, and trace them around with a pen. You don't want to use a rotary cutter on this quilter's template because it actually will just cut so easily with this one. So I trace it first. You can find your own favorite way to do it. And then I put a few pins in so that the two layers of the fabric or the interfacing don't slide because you'll find that this interfacing, the glue can be a little bit slippery and you'll get the sliding happening. So if we pin it together around the edges in just a couple of spots, then you can cut around it with the scissors or you can use your rotary cutter. Now, if you don't use the template plastic and just use the paper, do the same thing. You can trace the paper pieces with a pin or you can pin them in place with pins and um, cut around them. And so once we've got all those cut out, we can put our interfacing templates to the side. There are labels and I've color coded them just to match the cutting list so that you know at a glance which goes with which but I'll be honest with you um, I do this for people who prefer to have labels if you like to have labels use these there's one to match each of the cutting lists but if you don't like to use labels you can just do what I do and that is just to quickly write the letter on the interfacing or on the fabric. Now on the fabric, I don't write it in the middle because it could bleed through, especially 
with me using just an ink pen. So I do it somewhere in the seam allowances. I'll just write, for instance, that as a C. And if it does go through for some reason, it's on the seam allowance so you won't be able to see it. I like to give my fabric just a quick press before I get started. Get out any wrinkles, it kind of warms it up a bit. And then we'll do our interfacing first. So have a look over the edges and make sure it's centered. And G and C are very close to the same size. So make sure you don't have a G um, interfacing and you're putting it on a C piece and vice versa. But if you do, I mean, that's okay, right? It's okay if it's a bit too big or too small. So with our interfacing, and for most woven interfacings, if you give it a bit of a spray of water first, not only does it shrink in the fabric interfacing a bit, but it also creates a damp surface which will help with steam. And I use the high heat, high cotton heat, this is cotton interfacing and cotton fabric, so the glue is set up to fuse at those temperatures. Anything lower than that is not going to work because with cotton fabric, you use a cotton heat setting. So I start in the middle and I'll give it a bit of steam and then I'll overlap it. And the reason why I overlap everything, I don't just go side to side, is because every iron has holes. Some are bigger than this, but look at that, that's quite a big gap there. And if I don't overlap it, I'm gonna have sections that don't fuse. I don't know, you can even see the little bubbles here that haven't fused. So overlapping is key to have everything fuse. And I just hold it for a few seconds. There is a video for interfacing in particular. So if you need to refer back to that in the future, you don't need to track it down in this pattern. You can just go to our YouTube video and watch our interfacing instructional video. And after all that is done, I'll just look for any spots that look a bit bubbly and you can even test it to see if it's fused. So over there I need to go again. And then flip it over and give it just a once over. Now do that with all of your pattern pieces that have a coordinating interfacing piece, referring to your chart, and then you can go ahead with the fusible fleece on those exterior pieces that need it only. So you shouldn't have any fleece on any lining pieces. And I also give this a bit of water because steam really helps it stick down and you don't need to worry about a pressing cloth with this stuff anymore for the Pellon Thermalam Plus that is. If you have an older version, a few years old, or a different product, you will have to follow the manufacturer's directions for that because I'm not quite sure, and I don't wanna give you bad advice because that would really kinda of suck if you melted everything because I told you you didn't need a pressing cloth. So you can also just check the edges to make sure that it's fused in place. And then when it's done, have a look at the other side, give it a nice little going over and then let it sit. And the glues need a second to cool. And what you've got after com combining the interfacing with the fleece is a nice feeling fabric that's kind of soft in your hand. It's not stiff but it's, it's gonna be a nice, really feeling bag from the outside. It won't be super thin, and I really like that combination. Okay, so then after we're done this, um, I have one more pocket to do, and then after I'm done that pocket, we're gonna to go to marking the pattern pieces. Okay, we're back, and I have all of my exterior pieces, including my one that's from Accent Fabric cut out and fused with their interfacing and their fleece and then the lining pieces as well with their interfacing. And now we're ready to mark using either your paper templates or your plastic ones depending on what you have. 
And if you have the paper versions, just poke them out with a pen or a seam ripper, just poke a little hole. But if you're using the plastic template, I like to use a punch, just a number two punch. And then you'll just mark your holes and then you can either mark or snip for the one that's on the round curve, okay? For A and E, you can leave these unmarked. That's something we'll do after. And this doesn't have a magnetic snap on it, so it's actually done. And I'll put that with my exterior fabrics and put the template over there. Now for B, B has a center marking here. It actually doesn't have one here. This is an older version. I got rid of that on my new version of the pattern, so just ignore that. But it does have a magnetic snap marking, so we'll put that here. And I've also got an F there for females, just so we know what size of the snap to put on. So we'll put an F by that one. And then for C's, I have four of these to do. And what you can do is make sure when you mark them, you, you actually read what piece the snap goes on. So this says male on lining and female on exterior. So I actually didn't need to mark that one. This is an exterior fabric. So what I need to do is mark the female on an exterior and just one of them not two and for this you can refer to the chart so i'm on c c exterior c exterior on one only mark snap number two female so that is a female i put it off to the side because we may cover that and we won't be able to see it okay we'll keep this sky so I've got one lining piece here. What I want to do is now C, lining, mark male, male on lining. So this one I don't do, so. Male, okay. So I'm just gonna keep going through the rest of the templates or pattern pieces and mark either the centers or cut, it's up to you. But I don't need to do any more C magnetic snaps because I already did one lining and one exterior. And then D, same thing for D, it says right there, male side. So I'm just gonna go ahead and keep going through all of these and I'm gonna go through it one more time. If that seems confusing, I'll be clearing it up right away in the next section. In the package, we've got three magnetic snaps or if you have bought them individually, you can pull out three snaps. And you can use bigger ones for this, that's okay. You can use the small 14 millimeter or the 18 millimeter. It doesn't really matter. And we'll just separate them. Each half, uh, oh, or like really separate them because they seem to wanna get together as um, well as male and females do. There we go. Now. We're gonna have six stacks. B, female, washer. C, female, washer. C, male, washer. We'll just put these other C's with their, with their match just so that I like to keep my fabrics together so they don't get all over the sewing room. With this bag, I think organization is key. It really is. The sewing is actually quite easy. 
the organization is just a little bit more difficult. But once you have it all together in some organized stacks, it will be super fast and actually kind of fun. So then we have two left. We've got our G's and we need a female on there. Now, I don't know if you can see all these because some of them might be off camera, but we, I've made six little piles with my magnetic snaps and I'm just gonna do a double check with my chart, okay? So, first of all, lining. C, whoops, where are you, C? Male on one lining, G, female. B, we need a female. You just see? C, exterior, female. D, exterior, male. E, exterior, male. Okay, everybody is who they say they are. So now we just need to put these in. And I'm just gonna show you on one, not six. But you may notice that two have fleece on them already. So for the two who have fleece, we don't need to add an extra piece of fleece for stabilizing. We're just gonna do four of them with an extra piece of fleece. So we're gonna grab a one inch or so piece of fusible fleece. And what this does is it helps the um, magnetic or the magnet sort of sink into the fabric. It makes it a little tighter and it doesn't pull away so much and it makes it quite stable and more secure. So I know we just marked these, but we're gonna put a piece of fleece over them. So if you can't clearly see your M off to the side, just remark it. So this one is F. I'm gonna be covering it. I know it seems like we just marked them, but we are going to do it again. And then we'll quickly iron those on. Okay, those are all fused on again. And did you know that if you touch your magnetic magnet, this female side has the magnet, to the iron, it could be demagnetized. So just be careful not to do that. And what we'll do now is just remark them. Okay, now you wanna make sure these are very accurate. We don't want our snaps to be off in a little bit at all. So take your time, don't rush like I am, and make sure these are accurate on here. And I just realized, you know, I probably could have laid out the snaps after I put the fleece and remarked. So. If I could back up, I would lay these all out, put my fleece on, remark them, and then lay out my snaps so that they're all matched with um, the right fabric piece. Okay, so now we are going to put a magnetic snap on. And if you haven't done this before, it's actually just really quite easy. What you'll do is take your washer and place it over the dot that you've marked and mark the two slot holes very accurately. And then I'm going to use my seam ripper to cut the little slots. Now just make sure you start at the same spot on this line. So you don't wanna start cutting here in the middle, cut on the end and then be very careful not to make it too big. You can put a pin across cotton if you're worried about cutting it too far. That'll give you a little bit of a break. And then you can just try your magnet from the right side for fit. The hole being a little bit smaller than needed is, is a good idea because it could stretch around it. And then I'll have my E6000 glue or similar and just put a little daub on the back. And you don't need very much. You don't want it to squish out. 
Okay, and then put the backing on and you can bend the prongs to the middle. And then I also put a piece of interfacing on the back, which I have cut just some scraps. It doesn't need to be that big. It looks like maybe that big would do it. And you can glue this on or just fuse it on just on the edges there like so. Trying not to get it on the snap if it is the side that has the magnet. Okay, and then that snap is complete. You can see how the piece of fleece behind it just sort of helps it sink in. I'm just gonna do the rest of these now, and then we're actually gonna be ready to start sewing. All right, we're back from finishing assembling all the magnetic snaps. And I've had a coffee break, touched up my nails, and I'm ready to go. So I've threaded my machine with um, my thread that I'm going to be using for my outer and my straps. My straps are in the dark green, so I've actually got um, some Christmas pine thread. It's in the machine now, so I don't have that to show you. And then the rest of the bag, I'm going to use this cool mint. And the thread I'm using is our thread that we sell at Emmeline, it's a glide thread. It's 100% polyester, it has this beautiful sheen, and it just shows up beautifully. And I use it for all of my seams and my top stitching. So what I love about these thread spools is that you pop the bottom open like that, and then you can actually just put your thread in that little groove and close it, and then you don't have the I didn't, I didn't do it right. There we go. And then you have the thread all locked in your spool. Isn't that handy? I mean, I love the thread, but that's just an extra bonus for me. So I'm using that and I put a new needle in machine. My favorite for full leather and cotton is a Microtex needle, which is just a sharp needle. It has a nice fine point. So you get beautiful straight stitches with holes that aren't too big but it will go through our faux leather as well as cotton. And I'm actually making a secret faux leather version too out of this um, pastel because I want to show you how to make the straps with faux leather as well. So I'm making that on the side. So when we get to faux leather, I will show you that here in just a few minutes. So. The first thing we need to do is to make our cotton strap the right length. Now, if you're happy with the 44 inch length, don't need to add anything on to the end of it. But if you want it a bit longer, I've uh, suggested an extra 12 inches. Some people like them longer than that. This just adds a little bit of length for the crossbody. In Canada, we wear really puffy winter coats and it's nice to have a bit of a longer strap for that. Now, before we just get into sewing, I just want to mention that there is a lot of writing here and also, of course, the diagrams. Now, the diagrams don't show literally everything. The diagrams don't have all the little tips and notes that I have here in bold and in red. So I still would like you to read along and use the video and the images as a guide, okay? Because it's impossible for me as a pattern designer to absolutely get every detail in the images. Those are your cues and I think even after you've made one, you could probably follow along the diagrams and not need to read. But for this first one, read along and get all those little hints and tips because as I'm videoing here today, it's possible I'm going to miss mentioning something and I don't want you to miss out on something that's going to be a key element for your success. So here we go. We're going to start with the straps and you're going to make sure your bag strap is right side up and then you'll put your extension, however long it may be, if you're using one wrong side up over top and you're going to overlap the width of a quarter inch seam allowance over the top, have it extend a quarter of an inch and to the right also extend. Now for faux leather or fabric that is 54 inches wide, you don't need to do this. Now we'll take a ruler and join or sorry, match up our ruler 
to the inside groove of this connection and this connection. So that's going to give us our 45 degree straight line. And it's this is our sewing line. So you can go ahead and just draw that line in. And then I like to just put a pin or two in here. So by the time I take it to the sewing machine, it's not slid apart. And then what we'll do is just stitch along here. Okay, I've just sewn that line. And now we're going to trim off the excess fabric. So we'll cut over a quarter of an inch. And we can also cut off these little tabs at the end. Well, that one's not that important to cut off, but. Then we will press the seam open. And giving yourself a diagonal 45 like this helps flatten out the strap so that you don't have your seam allowance all in one bunched up straight line. So when we fold this and make a strap, the thickness is really dispersed over here, over the length of the strap, instead of all in one spot, because if it was straight across, it would make a bump there. We don't want a bump. So now what we're gonna do is add our interfacing over this. And that is exactly why we didn't do our interfacing first. Otherwise, we'd have interfacing in the seam there. We are going to do length and interfacing no matter how long they are. You know, this is a great scrap user for interfacing. If you have some lengths of interfacing, you can butt them up along here and use them. You can even cut your interfacing a little bit skinnier. If you want something a little bit thinner, you can use a piece of interfacing that is two inches wide or one inch wide and just put it on one section. We're just going to start about one inch from the end and that'll give us a thinner area to sew down here that doesn't have this medium, heavy or light interfacing in it, depending on what you're using. And then when you get to the end, just cut it off one inch before the end. And now we're ready to fold up our ends. So for this, I'm gonna turn my steam off so that I don't burn my hands. And I'm gonna turn up a quarter of an inch on each end. Or half an inch, something that's just straight. Okay, and now we'll fold our whole entire strap in half lengthwise and press along the fold. Okay, once that's pressed, you can now open the strap out and press one edge towards the middle. And if you've got a little bit of interfacing sticking out, that's okay. Just try not to have it overlap the fold, otherwise you'll get a bu some bunching up there on the corner. So just have it a little bit on the inside of the fold and not overlapping, otherwise you'll get bunching up. So press all along that fold. Okay, now that that side's pressed over, we're just going to press over this side as well keeping those ends folded in. Press along here. Okay, when that's done, you'll fold the whole thing in half, like so. And it tends to get rather hot, so if you wanna let it cool down so you don't burn your hands, let it cool down. But this one, you can give a shot of steam just for that final press. That's done. To be honest, I actually hate making straps, <laughs> but we have to do this one ahead of time because we need the strap anchor pieces done during the construction of the bag. So when we have this green thread on or a different color thread on to use to make these, we might as well go ahead and make this strap when that threads in the machine. Plus, then you don't have to do it later. It's done. So for the strap anchor, we're gonna do the exact same thing 
except we're not gonna fold the ends in first. So it's got its interfacing on. We'll fold it in half and press. We'll fold the outside edge to the middle and press. Turn it around, fold that outside edge to the middle. Hot, 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 these are hot. Ouch. And then maybe I'll just let that cool off a bit. It's hot. And then match it up the edge really nicely so they're not you know when you do this you want to make sure your edges look really nice and one is not wider than the other so adjust it as you go give it some steam okay so now we've got our cotton strap and our cotton strap anchor and these are going to get stitched around basically you're going to do a box around these guys. Don't worry about this being uh, raw edges, that doesn't matter. This end, th or sorry, this one will have the finished ends. Also stitch a box around here. We're gonna use that 1 8th of an inch so seam allowance. Go down the open end first, and then across the bottom and up the folded side. And when you're working with faux leather, I'll show you on the strap anchor. It's shorter, so it's easier to deal with. We can't press, but we can use clips. So what we'll do instead is fold the outside edge toward the middle line. And you tend to use a lot of clips for these straps, but um, I have a lot of clips. If you don't have a lot of clips, just do it in sections. And then the other one. Same thing. And fold together. And then what I do is I take the bottom clip and I clip it onto there. I take the top clip and clip it on. And I sort of alternate, like I put one there and one there, one there. Okay, same thing, we're gonna sew a box around. Now for the bag strap, instead of pressing over one end, just make sure when you're folding it, you also put a clip here. Now if you have quite thick faux leather, or thicker than this, this is only about 0.8 of a millimeter, or something that you know you won't be able to sew through, um, I think it's eight layers here. You can leave these strap ends as raw edges and you can paint them with edge paint or you can use a Sharpie pen or just leave them as they are. Um, I can stitch through eight layer layers there, with my sewing machine, so I am gonna go ahead and fold the ends over. Okay, now I'm gonna go do all the top stitching around these straps and bring them back, and I'll show you how to subcut the strap anchor into two pieces, and then we're gonna move on to making zipper pocket. Okay, so I've made my cotton strap, and that glide thread in green looks really good. I had a bit of a speed wobble at one point and now I can't even find it. So I'm not mad about it, it's all right. And here's the strap anchor. I've also done my one for my faux leather version um, and I sewed through the ends. Oh, I just need to trim those threads back to make them look a little nicer, okay. And the strap anchors, now I'm gonna cut in half. I've already marked them. They should be at six inches, so. They're 12 inches long and we're just gonna cut them half. So you can 
do that with a rotary cutter or you can measure and cut them. Yes, you cut through your stitches here, so they're not locked in, but that is totally okay. They will get enclosed in some basting and some stitching and some stop, top stitching, so they're gonna be stitched over three times. I should mention that if you're using poly webbing or cotton webbing for your strap anchors or your straps, just cut two pieces of webbing, six inches long, or if you've done one that is 12, just cut it in half. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the zipper pocket. Now, I generally draw my zipper boxes um, using measurements, but since we have this template that I mentioned earlier, we can use this to uh, draw the zipper box, but if you don't wanna use the template, there are some written instructions here for making sure that that box is exactly the right size at seven and a half inches long. We will go ahead and take our facing so that it is wrong side up. And no, this isn't interfaced. It doesn't really need to be. It's not structural. It's basically just to enclose our edges. And we will trace this box on the wrong side of the fabric. Okay, so for a cotton version, we've done this in the same fabric as the exterior fabric. But for a vinyl version, we've done the facing in the same version or the same fabric as the lining. And this is because if you're doing vinyl or faux leather for the exterior, you don't really want to have a thick facing like that. It won't fold nicely to the inside. So if you're using faux leather, make your facing out of a coordinating fabric or your lining, something that will just sort of blend in. So now what you can do is, oh, it looks like I'm a little bit small on that side. Let me just, I'm trying not to lean over it. So it's a little bit hard to see. Okay. So now mark the centers with a pen and then, or chalk, and then put your ruler just on the bottom half of that mark and draw a line through the center and then just a half inch in draw a line out to the corners okay now this part's really important with your piece d is it d yes right side up and with your facing wrong side up Lay them onto your surface like that. What you want to do is find the centers of both. So fold that in half and you can make a crease or a mark. And fold this in half, make a crease. If you wanna be able to see it better, you can do a little pen line. Okay. So we're just gonna put our ruler right on there. Line up these two guys. This will be roughly about a quarter of an inch from the bottom edge. So you, should, you could push it up there. And then to double check, the zipper box should be one and a quarter inch from the bottom edge. So we can just move that in so it sits along there. Make sure it's nice and straight. But the most important part is that the box edges are one and a quarter inch to the bottom edge of D and parallel. So if you've drawn it on a bit crooked, that's okay. Just line up that pen line along the ruler. Now we'll just pin it in place in a few spots. Of course, I didn't put anything plastic under here, so I'm just pinning right into my ironing mat. Maybe if I just slide this under there. There we go. Then I can pin. Now, take it to the machine and I'm only going to sew the outside edges of that box, not the line in the middle. All right, this is where I wish I had actually chose some darker thread because you can't see it very well. Like, you'll be able to see it in a sec when you see 
what is stitched and what isn't when I cut through. So if I use my seam ripper and I put a little spot in the middle just to get my scissors in, I'm going to cut right down that center line. You know, if you're like a super pro at this, you don't really even need to draw that center line, do you? I just always do it. I guess I'm not a super pro, but I mean, we all know how to cut straight, so you can just cut through the center and cut a pie wedge out into these corners. Be super careful. Don't snip the corner at all. Um, one thing you should be sure of is that your corners are nice and straight. That one's got kind of like a, goes in at the side, so I might have to redo that because it'll make it so that it doesn't, it's not a nice sharp corner there. So anyway, that's what we've got. And we're gonna press the facing to the other side. Okay, so I've got my magnet here. Actually, that's not the magnet side, so we don't need to worry about it, but it's not gonna get ruined if I hit it with the iron because it's not the side that has the magnet. But I'll go ahead and press over the facing just to get it started and going the right way on the ends too. This will get it the seam going halfway there. And then on the back I'll pull it through to the back side. And maybe just one side at a time I will ouch the second time I firm my hand on the iron today, the other side, time I wasn't on camera, had a few mishaps off camera. One was my 18 year old son stomping upstairs to try to annoy me because I think he thinks he's 12 or something and he wants to bug me. But, and the other thing was I got my caramel macchiato all over my sewing machine and had to clean that up. So yeah, there's lots of stuff going on behind the scenes. I'm sure Jace will start stomping again in a minute because he thinks it's super funny. Oh well, he's gonna go away to college in two weeks and I'm sure gonna miss him annoying me. So just be forewarned, if you hear stomping, that's my adult child Okay, so at any rate, and you can use a spritz of water to make it lay flat. Go to the front like this and give it a really good steam without steaming your fingers. I'll tell you, you'll be mad about that if you do it. I'm allowed to iron myself in the video, but I really don't want to hear that you've ironed yourself while making this bag. Okay, so make it nice and neat. Make it so that the edges um, aren't seen, if you like it. Some people actually have their lining fabric or their facing fabric poking out and it almost acts like a bit of a faux piping or it's sort of like half wilted. But I'm trying to make mine not visible. And the reason why I have the faux leather version here is because we can't iron that. And I wanna show you how we can deal with, with that. So one way of dealing with the faux leather is to do some understitching. So you can, I've tried gluing the spacing down. It doesn't really work, the glue. Glue soaks into fabric and doesn't often um, stick very good for facing. I'm sure if there's other tips out there to do this, um, they will be shared in our Facebook group. But one of the ways to deal with this is to do some understitching, which is stitching that's happening sort of underneath to stitch the facing to the seam allowance. So it's not gonna go through the front layer, but just from the facing to the seam allowance, 
And understitching is often things like fabric and facings to seam allowances. So we can't really stitch it um, in here like this. So what we'll do is we'll just take this to the sewing machine and we'll do one side at a time and I'm just gonna fold this over. I'm gonna stitch along here, right? Only like a 16th of an inch in, all in here, stitching through this. And I'm gonna do that all the way around and when I get to the corner, I will stop and then stitch across here and stop and then I'll stitch across here. And then that will get it so that it's popping th through a bit and then what we'll end up doing is rolling the whole thing back and we can tape this down or you can use some, I have these great things called sew tights and they're magnetic um, bars and those would be perfect for this but I think I took them to work. I can't find them here at home of course so I can't show you the sew tights but I'm just going to go and do that really quick and I'll show you what it looks like. Okay so I've done my in under stitching along that side and along this side. I didn't bother doing it in here because it's just so short there's no point so I just made sure that I started and stopped right at the beginning of uh, the seam there. I didn't go past. And now what we'll do is we'll fold this to the other side. And guess what? We can iron on this side so that when we put our zipper on, it'll hold down good enough so that we can get it all lined up nice and straight trim away any threads and there our zipper facing is tucked in just like that and that is the easiest way to do that if you don't like that little bit of print poking out I think it's kind of pretty try to use a fabric for your facing that is matching the color closest to your full leather okay so now we're ready to get our zipper assembled and we're gonna do that here um, okay, so one of the things you first have to make sure you do is uh, if you're using bulk zipper or zipper by the yard, you need to put your zipper slider on. And the other thing you should do is sew this close. So we actually don't even need these metal tabs right here. And as long as our zipper is big enough so that if we cut this off, it's not too short, you can even cut this off. It makes it so much easier if you are a beginner or if you don't want to sew through those little starts and stops because those will break a needle while sewing through this won't break your needle. So I'm just going to take this to the sewing machine. I'm just going to sew over the ends there and then we're going to get started on section, well we're still on step five uh, at diagram nine there. I think I'm going to take you to the sewing machine for that because it's actually really fast. Um, I honestly don't mess with my zipper foot even because I do have a skinny foot that I can use. So I'm just going to show you how to do that really quickly. Okay, I've got my two pocket pieces and my zipper. I'm going to sew this up really quick without even any pins or tape. So I just want to make sure with my directional fabric, the top is the part that is going alongside the zipper. So that's the top of my print. And I'm just gonna center my zipper over it and the ends can just hang off the ends of the pocket. And then I'm going to line this up on this edge. There isn't a lot of stretching that happens with this fabric because it has such nice stiff interfacing on it. And I'm going to lower my presser foot and I've lined it up with me five millimeter which is just less than a quarter of an inch a scant quarter of an inch and I'll just sew along the pocket and the zipper and now the instructions say to fold that to the back and press but I'm just going to do a finger press just press it like that 
it kind of folds naturally all on its own because of the where the interfacing sits on the edge. It folds right at that quarter of an inch mark. And then just using a 1 16th of an inch sewing. Oops, I've got my threads pulled in there. Got my zipper. So now I'll just stitch that down. And then we're gonna do the other side the same. So that is my top of my print, I think. Yeah, that was the top. And then this is the right side of the zipper with the right side of the pole up. And I wanna match this up so that it is centered with the pocket underneath. And I'll do the same thing and stitch it at five millimeters or a scant quarter of an inch. And this foot just fits in here perfectly, so I don't need to use a zipper foot. If I had a wider foot, I'm gonna just use a zipper foot for this. And then I'll flip it to the back, do the same thing, press it down. Okay, and now I'm ready to take this back to the table and I'll show you how we lay our D piece on top of here and put our zipper on. Actually. Hold on, while I'm here, how about we pull the zipper back and then we'll just stitch along here just to keep it right in place and that way it keeps the ends of our zipper together there when we're trying to put the pocket piece on. Okay, so that's what we just did. We just sewed that together and now we're gonna put our D piece over top as shown in diagram 12, the zipper is on the left and the pockets are wrong side up and it just feels wrong. But if you think about it, when inside your pocket, when you open it up, you've got your pretty fabric in here. So let's get this on top of here. So the facing will be folded to the inside and tucked away and we're going to line this up so that our facing edge on this side and this side are centered so they match along the pocket edge here and the pocket edge here okay so we want to keep that lined up and the other things we want to do is we want to keep this zipper centered in here so in order to do that it takes a bit of fiddling we need to pull this zipper head back so that it's inside the zipper box okay and this is where I do use the tape. So pull the threads out of the way. And I've got the 1 8 inch tape. Oh my goodness, it's like, what the heck? I am just a mess sometimes, I tell ya. I use less of this tape than I used to because I find, I mean, you could use it in so many places, but like in the step we just did, I used to use that to tape my zipper down, but when your pocket has that stiff interfacing like that, you get a lot less stretching, and the zipper stretches doesn't stretch as much when it's just a short zipper. Okay, so one little strip of this, I'll put on the top edge of the zipper, and since we're not sewing that close to the edge, we won't be sewing through it, I mean, even if we do sew through it, your, your needle might get a little sticky. You can just use an alcohol swab or even just like a warm, wet microfiber cloth to clean it. Okay, so we'll just take off one side at a time and we'll line that up again. Now, when I'm looking at this, I've got to stick my head like right over top of it to see. I'm going to make sure I have a look and see where the zipper needs to sit in conjunction to where this pattern changes on the zipper. The, when you have zipper, sometimes you'll see a bit of a pattern change in the tape. And if you pick out one of those lines exactly where you want your box to sit, you can actually use that as a guide to make it straight so that it's even on both sides. 
So I have a little bit of a, a line here that kind of looks like a triple stitch. And then in front of it, there's another line that kind of looks like a an Egyptian sort of this. And I'm gonna just use one of those lines as a almost like a, a guide for where I want to put my zipper. So first things first, it's not centered. It's way too far to the right. So I'm gonna get this centered again. I'm gonna take the center mark and I'm gonna pull it down. I can sort of see in here where that triple stitch is and I'm gonna line that edge up all the way along the triple stitch on the zipper tape. Now my tape is different probably than yours. So have a look at your tape and see what you have on there as a guide. So what we'll do is we'll just adjust it and make it straight. And then I'll pull up the bottom. So that it can stick down and then Gonna have a look at this. I've got like quite a wobble there, so I'm just gonna pull this down so I can see. Take your time, mess with this, get this straight. If you don't, you, you're gonna stitch it down and the zipper's gonna be crooked and that's gonna bug you. So I'm gonna spend a little bit more time and then I'm gonna sew around here. Okay, I've done all the stitching around the outside of the zipper box and you can see my lining in there. And now we're just going to finish making our zipper pocket. So we have the two lining pieces, like so. And I actually went ahead and did a couple things I wasn't supposed to do yet, just because I thought I was recording and I wasn't. So one of the things I did was trim my zipper ends close to the ends of the facing. So those are trimmed off. And we'll flip this to the back and pull the pocket down. And when you do, this bottom of the pocket edge is much longer than this one. And that is shown here on page eight, diagram 13, that's where we're at. The bottom edge of the pocket piece is longer, so you'll just need to cut that off so that they're now both the same length. And then what we do is we fold up a quarter or three eighths of an inch on each side and press so that we have this finished opening for when we turn our bag. I like to use my, it's called a hot ruler by Clover and it's really easy to get a nice even press that way. What you do is you fold the fabric up to meet the lines on the ruler grid and then press along there and you press right on it and it sort of holds the heat and makes it nice and I would say nice and flat because it holds the heat for a second. Kind of like when you're using a clapper, how a clapper holds the heat and makes a really rigid press. And then we fold up the bottom, the other side, to just to match that. So I just folded that up and pressed along there. So we're not actually gonna sew this closed though. We're going to sew just the sides because we want to keep this as our opening for turning the whole bag. So what you'll do is you'll just take this to the sewing machine and looks like I've lost my clips so I'll just put a couple pins in to hold them together. There. And ah, here. So you can use a quarter of an inch seam allowance maybe up here at the top because you need to get right in close. If you need to use your zipper foot to get up there, up there and close, you can. It just makes a nice strong end of pocket where it gets a lot of wear and tear. And then just down the sides here and here. So when you do that, you need to fold your pocket piece out of the way. So you fold this like this and sew here. And then when you do this side, you could start here and fold this back like that, or you can fold it to the back and do this way. Actually, I like doing it this way. I like to, so I'm just gonna go do that now, if I can get my pins to stay in. 
and then I'll come back and we're going to actually start assembling at step six right here. Okay, and I brought my clips back from the sewing machine with me. It just seems like I carry them around and leave them everywhere. Now you want to make sure your pocket is folded down going into the bag and not orientated up this way. So when you do fold that pocket piece down, just make sure the pocket extends below the straight bottom of D. Okay, now we're going to move to step six and you'll want to get your D and B pieces and also your two lining H's, which are these ones. Now, if you haven't marked your lining H's, you can do that now. Just double check that you have these dots marked because those are gonna be important for when we attach our gusset. And I actually had to recut these because <laughs> I stitched this pretty lining one onto my vinyl version and I didn't and I trimmed the seam allowances back already and so I didn't couldn't get them off so now I had to make new ones stuff always happens when you're sewing and you just need to roll with the punches and I don't need to mark this center bottom because I clipped it when I cut this out so got our two H pieces and we'll start with piece number B and we'll match that up to the top edge of H. Now in the written directions, I have you clip together and sew B to H and then do the seam or open, press the seams open and do the top stitching. And then I have you clip together H with the bottom of D and do the same thing, but I'm gonna do them both at the same time. So fold the pocket down and out of the way when you're clipping and matching the top, sorry, it's actually the bottom edge of D to the top edge of H. We're not gonna sew through the pocket and I'm just gonna sew these together with a my seam allowance, which is 3 eighths of an inch and I'm gonna come back and we'll press the seams open. Okay, I've done both of those. Stitched the seam down here and now I'm gonna press it open. And to do that, first I'll do a uh, finger press with them open or you can use a seam roller. But this really just gets it so it's started and going the right direction. If you've got some interfacing in there, it pushes it over and then when you get your iron in there, you can just press along here with the seam open. And then I like to give the front a little bit too. And then what we'll do is we will top stitch on both sides of the seam along here like this. And I've already done that on my other one. I've already done that on the B version. I've gone ahead and pressed and top stitched along both sides of here. And I'm going to cut the seam allowance a little bit on each end and just trim it back. And that I show you, where is it? There's a little close up on diagram 16. And the reason why I'm doing that is because this is going to be an intersection of where um, our outer bag attaches to our inner bag and if we have a little bit too much, much seam allowance here it creates a little bump so this just makes it easier to go over so when you're using a lot of extra materials like vinyl and also cotton and interfacing keeping the interfacing out of the seam allowance which we did here and also keeping extra fabric out of the seam allowance really just makes it easier to sew so we don't need to go all the way across just going in about three quarter to, to an inch inside will just work fine because we're going to be stitching right at the three eighths of an inch mark there okay now we'll put these 
Well, actually, we won't put this aside. I'm going to go ahead and finish top stitching this. And then we're going to get started on the gusset and sewing the gusset in the bottom. Now we are ready to add our gusset pieces. But first we need to make them. And I've already made it, but I'll show you how I did that on my other one. We, you just take your two F pieces, it's really simple. Put them right side together, sew them together, and then Open it up, press your seam open, and top stitch along here. And I've done that on this one already, okay? So now we have the seam, which is a center, and you can grab either one of these two. We'll start with the one that is with number B. And we have that center mark in the back, plus we have the pen marks that we made at the top of F, and we have the dots that we've made on H. And these are all parts where we're going to match them up. Now when I'm matching up something that I don't want to slide at all, I actually don't use a clip. I will use a pin. So I'm just going to match the seam with the mark. And I just find that the pins help them stay put a little bit better so they don't slide. And then I'm gonna match F, the dots on F to the dots on H. Now, I do make a comment in there about having to clip this, and I know that it's a little bit short, and that is on purpose. That's so that we don't have excess fabric in here that creates puckers. Plus it makes a very nice flat bottom if we had a lot of excess fabric in here that was bunchy it would kind of want to sag at the bottom and this creates a nice straight flat bottom because that's you know as much as it can flip down right because it's a little bit too short so I already know that I already know that we want to clip this so I'm just gonna go ahead and do it so I'm gonna clip this gusset only in about an eighth of an inch or just a little bit more than an eighth of an inch which is I guess about three sixteenths so three to four millimeters the stitching line is here at three eighths and we never want to go that far but an eighth of an inch is really all that we need and if I go about every inch and I make these clip marks it's enough it's enough to help this ease in around the curves and some people clip both this and this, but this doesn't need to ease in. The purpose of clipping that would be so that there is less bulk in the seam allowance, but I'm not going to be, um, or I'm going to be trimming that seam allowance down anyway. So, I don't clip it, because it's gonna be trimmed. And I'm just gonna go ahead and do the other side. Why not just do both sides at once? Get it all done. In fact, I'll probably pause this and do it on the gusset for my other bag because I'm making the two at the same time. Now, if you go too deep with this, the other thing that could happen if you're working with vinyls or bow leathers is you kind of get a, instead of a nice rounded seam, you get a, a jagged, toothy looking seam. There's a name for that. I'm not sure what it is, but just don't clip too deep. Now, put that on there and I'll take another pin and I'll match my dots up where is it way up there I want these to be the same and accurate on both sides so I'll just put my pin through my dot on the front and through the dot on the back and and like so. Now what we can do is just ease this into place like so. Start at the bit of a straighter edge that we have going here and this I will use the clips for this. There's pins in there and then clip around as 
So you pull it a little taut as you go. And maybe I'll go down here as well. And if you find it's not easing in as well as you like and you get the little edges that are flipping up like that, give it a couple more clips in between the ones that you did already. Around the, cur the tightest curves, a half inch clips every half inch might be needed. Okay, so we've put the last clips in and as you can see, there's no puckers in here because it was eased in. So try to remember when you're putting in a gusset or something similar to that is the item that you're stretching around and bending to fit the item that's sitting flat should be on the top. So I'm just gonna sew around here and um, use my 3 eighths of an inch seam allowance at the top but because this is a lining, I want it to fit in the bag a little bit smaller than the outer. So I'm actually going to start, I'm all, I'll use a pen here. I'll start with my 3 eighths of an inch seam allowance here, and then I'm gonna move out, I'm gonna move out just to about a half inch and go around at a half inch around here. And what that does is it helps that lining sit in the bag a little bit nicer because it's a little bit smaller. I'll do the same thing. When I'm getting to this part here, I'm coming around and I'm doing a half inch, I will move back over to 3 eighths of an inch for here so that when we finish up, we finish up at 3 eighths in both spots. So I'm just gonna go sew that now. Okay, so I've just sewed around there. I was very careful not to stitch past or in front of the dot, but I started at the dot where we matched and did a forward backward stop start to make that nice and secure and did the same thing here. St stopped here and did a reinforcing stop stitch. Now what I will do is gonna, I'm gonna do the same thing to the other side and we just have to be careful when you sew the gusset on here that you don't sew the pocket in. So we'll flip it out of the way and we'll match the other side. You can just squish this down, that's fine match the center seams or I've got my little center cut in here somewhere oh there it is with my pin and then I'll match my dots over here and I'll just be very careful to pin only through the dot and not into this fabric here because we don't want to sew there we want to start right here at the dot and sew along here. Okay, so seems like I left all my pins over there. Just double check that. And then I'm gonna ease in that fullness along here and clip and the same thing over here. I'm gonna clip this in here and ease in all the fullness on there as well. Okay, so I've got all that clipped together and I think I'm gonna take you over to the sewing machine for this because I think I have a few tips that I could share with you on how it is, how to sew around these curves and make it a little bit easier. Okay, I've got a few things at my sewing machine that I brought and one is just some quilter ruler tape. This is tape that you can apply to rulers and they sell it at quilting shops. Oh my gosh, I've had this for so many years, I wouldn't even know uh, what it's called. And then I've just put my ruler underneath to mark a half inch because I really didn't have a good half inch mark on here. And I found that when I was sewing this side, I went kind of all over the place. So I thought, yeah, well, I'll put some tape down. So you can use masking tape for this too. This just comes off really easy with no sticky. And I put that down, so that's going to be my mark for when I do my wider seam allowance. And then I've got my clips here to put, my, my little basket for my clips to put my clips in after. And then I also brought an awl. And I'm just going to show this to you because I like this tool to help me poke in and guide things along when I'm sewing. So when you start sewing, you really want to start at that dot and not before but we don't wanna sew directly on our pins. So what I do 
and this will be right at the 3 8 seam still. We're not sewing half inch yet. As I put it in, and then I pull my pin out, and then I drop my needle into the marking. So just wanna make sure there's no puckers or overlaps with this side. I wanna make sure it's not under the needle. So I'll just pull that tight and it's not under the needle. And I'll fold that down. And then we're just going to stitch a few stitches forward and then three stitches back. And now we have created that locking stitch with the stop start. So as you pull out the clips, your fabric can bounce inward and that's where I use the awl. So as I unclip, I will go ahead and hold it down with the awl and I can get really close with that without, well, kind of without my fingers getting in the way of um, watching you so see me sew as well. So I'll start at 3 8 and then I'm going to move out to here. Now I'm at a half inch and I can take these clips off. And now the curve thing, think of it as a straight line. Just turn your hand and you're still sewing in a straight line. Your hand is just pushing the fabric into it. Now, if you use your hand as an anchor here, it actually just rotates on its own. You put a little bit of pressure right here and it just turns. As we go around the curve, just flatten it out. Flatten so that there's, you're not sewing over a pucker. I'll show you that a few more times. So sew, and then as you get to one of these puckers, pull it, flatten it, pull the clip out. Flatten. And as you notice, or you may notice, I'm leaving my needle down every time. So I have a setting where my needle will stay down. If you don't have that setting, just use your hand crank, crank towards you, never away, and set your needle in when you pull, when you stop sewing. So that'll make sure that you don't slide out of the way. So I'm just going to flatten this out. I've got a bit of a bump right there, so I'll take this out. And just smooth it and you don't need to go fast for this we're not running a race I was telling one of the girls at work that it's like I feel like I'm running a race whenever I sew I feel like I need to sew as fast as I can so I get a lot of things done and that is when a lot of my little as I say speed wobbles but crooked sewing occurs is because I'm just rushing I think that Sometimes if you just sort of sort of just take the joy um, in enjoyment of sewing, kind of like when you eat a meal slowly and enjoy, you know, the flavors, if you take your time and don't feel like you're not a great sewer because you're going slow, feel like you're really enjoying the process and making sure that it's something that you're gonna be happy with after and enjoy the process of sewing and that's what I'm trying to do because yeah I tend to be a speed sewer so now as I get around closer to my end oh I could see a few of my stitches came out from where I attached the gusset over here I probably am gonna have to restitch that I'm gonna stop right here but I want to get back to my 3 8 of an inch seam allowance as well. So I'm going to get in a little closer and I'll do my locking stitch. And then I'm going to go back over here to this other side. And I'm going to fix that. Now this is called a Y seam. A Y seam is where it looks like a Y and three pieces of fabric are joining in. And if you don't make sure you have good stops and starts for your Y seam, you will have a hole there. So I don't wanna have a hole here. That looks good. Okay, so those are done. And we're ready to work on step 
the steps in diagram 20 where we're stitching between the dots and we'll need pins for that. There's not very many pins here. Okay, I've got my travel pins. Let's see. That is the magic pins. They're in there with magnets. Look at this. Oops, they're not supposed to fall out. I think they're falling out because I've got them in there upside down. Like, see, this one's upside down. If you don't throw them in upside down, they don't fall out. Anyway, I love them. I use this at work and I brought it home. Okay. Now, uh, let's see. It might be easier. We pull that pocket piece out of the way. We're going to be stitching in between this dot, the stop start of the gusset, and the seam here between D and H. That is our stop start. So let's just pull that little point out of the way and pull it down. We don't need to sew over that because we want to stop at the dot and not go past it. So it's just pulled down. And we don't need to pin there because it's being held together. But I find that if I do put a pin there, it lets me see quite easily when I'm sewing where to stop. And then right at the seam, where B and E join. So what I want to do is match them up so they're perfectly together. And oh, it looks like I never trimmed the seam allowances out of this set. So I'm just going to do that. This side as well. Okay. Now I'll also pin on the other side, pull that triangle tip down and out of the way. And this will be my stopping point. And also match up these seams so that they're lined up evenly and pin there. Oh my gosh, I've got all kinds of pins in that pin case. And we're basically going to be sewing along the edge of this interfacing line here. It's kind of almost like a mark for us. Okay, so I've just done those and we've got our inside of the bag and it looks really good. Have a look and make sure you don't have any holes at your Y seams. They should be nice and flat. Where are they? There's one right there. Now, don't be alarmed that your snaps are not in the same place as far as lining up. They're not supposed to be because when the top of your bag folds over, you're going to have a little bit of that accent fabric or other outer fabric sticking out there. And we're, before we move on to the next section, we're just going to trim some seam allowances. So trimming this down helps it sit nicer in the bag and helps your curves round out because there's less bulk in them. So I'm not going to cut this here where we haven't stowed yet. I'm just going to leave that for now. So I'm going to trim this down to just about an eighth of an inch along the side here and on both of the gusset pieces. And I just don't want to cut my pocket, so I'm just going to flip that out of the way. I'll start here. And let's see. Might be able to cut both of those at the same time right there but that's kind of risky so i think i'll just switch to one side oh yeah super risky don't do what i do just follow my instructions so i'm just going to trim this down to an eighth of an in inch or just a little bit more and then we'll be able to move on to the next step in the bag which is step seven assemble the exterior on page nine Okay, we'll start step seven, and I've got a few things I've gathered together. Some clips, our two O-rings, the strap anchors, the two G pieces. One has a snap and one does not. We'll just put those aside. And the A, well, that's not the right template for that. The E and A pieces. Okay, we'll start with a 
and we'll lay the template piece over top of the right side. And then I'm gonna take, you can mark this with chalk or something that comes off, or I just like to put my template piece over top. And what we want to do is um, put our strap anchors right over those um, marking spots. In the instructions, I do one at a time. For the video, I'm gonna show you to do two, both at the same time. Now, one of the strap anchors has a fold and one has the open edge. I just want them both to be the same when I put them on so they, they look nice together. I like the fold on the top, sort of, when you're, or towards the inside. So I'll place this strap anchor down with the fold here, and this corner here is gonna match up with the edge of the fabric, which means this side corner here is going to tuck down, or sorry, extend down below the edge of the fabric and I'll just clip those in place and then I've got the fold to the inside and that corner is going to match the edge of the fabric with this other corner extending below. Now I can just pull my A template out and what I'm going to do now is just baste across these ends and for basting, I'll use a long stitch at about a quarter of an inch so that it's within the same allowance and so that we don't see it. I'm just gonna go do that now. Okay, those are basted in place. And I'm just gonna follow my instructions to find out which G piece for sure goes with this A. So in the top section, it says exterior pocket lining G with the magnetic snap, wrong side up over A. So G with the magnetic snap, where are you? Right here, that's this one, and let's make sure it's not a C, it's a G. So we're just gonna line up these bottom edges right here and clip it or pin. And I'm gonna go and sew this with my full seam allowance. I'm not basting here. Oh, maybe while I'm there, I'll go ahead and do the top stitching. So then I'll top stitch along here, okay? Okay, so with the seam allowance folded down and not up or open, it's sort of the path of least resistance for this seam allowance because we've got these big strap anchors here. I've gone ahead and top stitch along there. Now, before we do the other side, we need to flip this over, okay? Make sure that's wrong side up. We're not gonna sew through this, but we need to make sure these straps come to the front. And then what we'll do is take E, and I'm also, I'm just gonna use the same template A for this one. You don't have to use E. It's the top edge that's shorter for A, but the bottom side is exactly the same. So I'll just set that there so that it's even and not crooked, and then we'll thread an O-ring on here. That's probably really important. Ask me how I know. And then we'll fold this to the front. Now I have had some of my testers somehow twist this and put it to the front. And I mean, and that's a look if you wanna do that. Just make sure they're both the same. down here like so and clip it it's kind of there's a bit of resistance here because I think maybe because of the template so I might just go ahead and mark these two corners and then take it away yeah, that folds nicer. And then I can just lay it over top of the old one so I know that they're going at the right angle. The angle should be the same for both. And we'll just clip it. And then clip this one here. I'll just pinch it together. Okay, so now when I go to sew these ones in place, 
I'm just gonna flip that bottom out of the way and just sew to E. We definitely don't wanna sew to through to all of, uh, through all the layers. So I'm just gonna go and baste this here. Okay, done. Now we can take our other G piece and attach it the same way. Just keep that bottom part flipped out of the way. I kind of like it down there while I'm setting it up because then it's not making a bump. But then when I go to sew it, I'll flip it out of the way. So right now, I'll just leave it there. And I will clip this together. Okay, so I'm gonna sew these together, but not through all the layers. What I'm gonna do is flip that out of the way. I'm now sew through G and then I'll fold it over and press the seam allowance to the G side, like so, and top stitch along there. Okay, that's done. I'm not gonna lie, I didn't actually press it, I just folded it over and stitched it. I tell you to press it, cause that's the right thing to do. Okay, so now we have, what do we have, G, or A and E, okay. So we're ready to make our C pockets and assemble them and put them on each side. So the C pockets are these guys here. So you can see how this is coming together. Now we're going to make these outside pockets. One has a, one that snaps closed and the other one has a snap on the front that E comes down and closes onto. So we want to make sure we get those lined up right. But first we'll make both of the C sections. So when you're reading the directions, make sure you pay particular attention to which goes with which. So it says the exterior fabric with snap, right side together with the top edge of lining piece C with no snap, which means these two are left to go together. So I'm gonna to take these to the sewing machine and sew them together along the top edges. Okay, so those are stitched and now we can, well actually we need to trim this. So in the instructions, I do mention just trimming back the corners or you can just trim the whole thing if you want. Either works and that just creates that little bit less bulk like we talked about at those intersections because this is going to be um, quite a bulky area. I'll show you where it is on the bag. Oops, that, don't look at that one. That one did, I did bad. Okay, so right here, they should be lining up nicely. But we trim the seam allowances out of here it's a lot nicer to stitch through here so when we put our pockets on we're gonna do a better job than I did that time okay so you can oh actually I don't need to press those open if I follow the instructions I'm just folding it over silly me fold it over and actually when I do that I like to have a little bit of the lining or sorry the little a little bit of the exterior poking up so that the lining isn't showing on the front I would rather not have the lining showing on the front I would rather have the exterior showing a little bit on the back and that's just personal preference so I roll the seam towards the lining side and press like so. So now you can see, oh, I've got a thread in there, the edge of the exterior fabric, but on this side, you can't see the lining. So I'll do that for both. And it's okay if the lining sticks out a little bit there. That's because we rolled it. I'll just trim that. But I'll top stitch along here and then I'm going to base stitch a quarter of an inch seam allowance along here and then just trim off that little extra bit of lining and I'm going to do that for both of these 
And now we'll grab our bag panel and follow the instructions on page 10 as to which pocket piece goes onto which side of the bag panel, because that's really important. What we want here is to have side E with the magnetic snap paired up with the C piece with the magnetic snap on the front. So I'm just going to flip this back one out of the way because we're not clipping to that. And I'm going to line up these bottom edges here. And I do have some center markings here that I can line up and make sure it's not crooked. And I'll clip there at the center marking. And then this top of the pocket will extend past G, just so that G is tucked under um, and we can't see the lining from the front. I made it a little bit shorter. So don't match up that to that seam, but let it sit past it. And make sure that these are just straight. So what I would do is you could even measure between here. Just make sure it's sitting nice and straight because that's where your pockets are going to line up on your final um, exterior of the bag. And then we'll just clip in here a few clips to hold it in place so it doesn't go crooked on us. And then I'm going to stitch around here, but this is just a basting stitch. So we can just go over the basting stitches we already did on the pocket at the quarter of an inch mark and we'll base, base that onto here. Then we're going to flip this side over, do the same exact thing. This snap actually does match onto that snap there. And we'll line up our center markings again on the lining piece with this outer, which I can't find at all. Anyways, I will find it. I will find it. There it is, written on my C. So these are important if things kind of go a little bit astray, just to keep get us back with the right curve. And there. Now I'm going to clip these and I see that my lining is poking out a little bit here and I'm going to go with the exterior fabric shape when I sew this together and trim that lining edge away just so that it matches perfectly with the other one. So you can do these one at a time or you can do them at the same time but we're just basting around the C pockets and then we're going to be putting the gusset on after that. Okay, one thing to take note of when you go to sew is that you don't want to sew through these anchors. So when I'm sewing here at the top of the pocket, I'll need to pull that out of the way. And if you want to pin it down, you can like that or clip it, but you just need to pull it out of the way when you get started. We don't want that in our side seams. Okay, those are all basted along here. And what we have now is this outer panel that is connected only in between with the strap anchors and they're not twisted. And our bag is going to fold over like this when it's done. Okay, so what we need to do now is the gusset. And that is put on exactly the same way that the gusset is put on on the lining. So I've stitched my two pieces together. I've pressed the seams open and then did my top stitching and now we want to start putting it onto the outer fabric through one layer only. So we'll just flip the bottom one out of the way, it doesn't matter which one you start with, and we're going to go ahead again and line up our centers and the spots where the dots on the end of F go are marked on G. So what you really want to do is have a look at your G pieces now and make sure that they actually have these dots marked on them. And as you can see, another thing to notice is that it's gonna get a little bulky in here where all these seams are. So now would be a good time before we start to actually trim a little bit of that out of there so that when we are completing these, 
we don't have a lot of bumps and things to worry about. So I've just trimmed the seam allowance a little bit from A and cut off these corners. I think it helps a bit. It's not necessary, but then let's see. I'll just we've got our markings on G and now we can attach our facing. So right sides together, we're going to match up those center marks again. And there's a center mark here on G with the seam at the center bottom. And then we will curl this around. Oh, and you know what I forgot to do? I forgot to do all my little snippies. So I'm going to take that off and then I'm going to go ahead and mark this about every three quarters or half an inch. If you're using faux leather or something that's a little thicker, you're definitely going to want to do this. Just make sure you don't snip in too far. It's better to have snips closer together rather than too deep. Otherwise, it may look like a jagged edge. So go ahead and do that. Okay, so that's all done. I've stitched between these dots here. And um, I did not stitch that to it. Um, except for the little spot where I did. Apparently this was under here like this when I was sewing and I, I caught it right there and I had to rip it out. So now what we'll do is we'll put these right sides together and you can just flip that guy out of the way so that your bag is right side together. And remember how I talked about you should always take the thing you're curving and manage to attach it to the flat piece so you really wouldn't want to put this like this and start pinning it around. So put that flat piece down first and the thing, the item that is being curved to fit goes on top. So you'll start at center again with your pins and then clip it all the way around and then we will stitch around the gusset and then when we come back we're going to sew these side seams that are right here. So now we're going to finish these seams here. Um, that would be diagram 31 and it looks like I have my dots marked on A but not on E, the other side, but that's okay. I'll just use my A marks for that. Now you probably see this ring sticking out. We definitely don't want to sew through that. So this needs to be pushed all the way. So just push with your finger all the way in. And you know, I might actually just put like a pin down in here to keep it out of the way. Okay, so I'm gonna line up this, these edges here. And that is where I'm gonna sew between the dots around this curve and I'm going to end at the top of F because we don't want a hole right here. So I'll just pull that seam allowance down, hold, keep it close together and then I'll put a pin in just like we did when we did the lining so that I know where to stop. I'm going to stop right there. That way we don't have a hole. And then I'm just going to double check my pocket, C pocket tops to make sure they're still matched up. Pull the threads out of the way. Yes, they are still matched up. I'm going to put a pin in there, hold it. As I get past this anchor, I'm going to keep my hand there. I'll have to pull that pin out so that I don't sew over it. But the idea is to go along here all the way to the top of F and stop. There's a lot of bulk in here. This may take a couple times um, sewing. So if you kind of slide off to the edge, just finish it up and then go back and do it again. Okay, so I stitched between here and here. And while I was stitching, I had that strap anchor pulled all the way out of the way like so because we don't want to sew on it and it's a bit high through here but your foot just squeaks by and you stop at the dot and now I'm just going to check and make sure that those seams look good that there's nothing caught in them that's not supposed to be caught in them 
Um, well, my pockets didn't really stay on top of each other. I think because of the the um, thickness there, they tend to just sort of slide out. And I mean, that's okay. Um, and the seam looks good. And the top of the Y seam looks good on that one. And then over here, how does this one look? Oh, nice, nice Y seam there. And there's the tops of my pockets, not really quite lining up, but job hazard. But I think that's the best I could do. And then that seam looks nice. So now we're going to keep this wrong side out and we're gonna trim the seam allowances just like we did previously. We're gonna not, we're just gonna start, we're just gonna start trimming up just a little bit, about a half an inch below where we stop stitching, below the dots. And then we will trim these sides down a little bit. You don't need to trim too much out of there, but it's nice to trim the gusset back. Just double check that you're not cutting any seams. Okay, everything's all trimmed up there. And what we'll do is the outer stays right, wrong side out. The lining now gets turned right side out. Tuck that pocket in so it's down inside. Most importantly, open that zipper pocket up because that's how we're going to be turning the bag. Now, the A piece is the back of the bag. It folds to the front. So if you want your zipper to be on the A piece, this is the A piece. Oops, ah. This is the A piece, and I want my zipper to be on that surface. And I'm going to put my zipper next to it right sides together and that is how I'm going to tuck this into the exterior get that all in there nicely it's not going to stay in there so it doesn't have to be all fitted in there into the corners it's going to be turned out so now what we'll have is right sides together D and A and B and E and then we'll match up these sections where they join here. So what we want to do is match up these corners and we're going to start pinning. I have to pull the pocket out of the way so it doesn't get stitched. Okay. So open up the seam allowances if they're a bit folded. Match up those corners. And pin or clip in place. I do like the pins for things that I don't want to slide. And that pocket piece, if it's sticking out a bit, I mean, we could trim that down a bit. It's all been stitched and triple stitched there. We could trim it there. As long as I don't trim my actual pocket stitching, I could trim that out. Then it won't get in the way so much. Just don't cut your pocket open. Okay, and then on this side, we're also going to leave that in just a little deeper. Get that lining pushed in. Match up the seam allowances where they Start and stop, and we will pin here. Now, it's kind of nice actually to just do one side at a time. So I'm going to match up these center markings on B and E, and turns out I paint pinned that side, so I'm gonna. Take it out. I'm going to match B and E. Yes, it's just nice to do one side at a time. And um, 
pin around the opening here. Clip. I find if I use too many pins, I'm going to get stabbed. So I'll use pins where I think it's most important. And then I use clips because it's less hazardous for my fingers, my arms. And then what we'll do is I'll just do one side at a time and stitch between here and here. And I feel like that's easiest actually stitching inside. So what I do is I start inside here and then I end there. And actually, you could start way over here. Start here and end here. And then you only have a little bit to do going this direction. So it's easier to sew into the join than away from the join if that makes sense because of the bulk so if I was to put my foot on here it would just I would never get close to there to that point so I want to start with my foot here if you have a free arm this is going to be super easy because you just put your machine free arm in here and sew to there I'm just going to show you how to Sew this so that you don't have to set your machine into this tight corner. What you can do is just start sewing away from the, uh, about an inch away from the intersection there. And we'll line up our seam allowance and make sure we're at 3 eighths of an inch. And then we'll sew around it. Okay, so then we start to get close to the first corner or the join and it gets a little bit snug so we'll sew as far as we can go right up to where the pin is it's really hard to see and then back stitch okay and then we'll flip this over and do the same thing from the back just make sure you pull that other side down and then from the back side, pull it down. Oops. And if you want to write draw, or draw your sewing lines on here, you can do that too. Okay. So after we've done that and trimmed the seam allowances, we can pull the pocket out and turn the bag right side out through the pocket. So you'll pull the lining out first and then keep on going. Okay, pull the lining back down in there. Now we can tuck the pocket in. I'm not going to sew it up yet. I just want to make sure everything is looking really good before I sew that up. Okay, so this is all going to be pressed out nicely. And we've got our inside fits in there really nicely with the smaller seam allowance. And then our top flap fits over. What we're going to do now is top stitch around the um, these parts here. So when you do this, you need to think about what thread color is going to be showing. So your bobbin thread is going to be showing on this side and this side, and your top thread will be here and here. So press it out first with the iron. You want to get these all pressed out so they're nice and round. And then we'll top stitch all around here. And then we'll be able to do the straps after that. Okay, I've just completed the top stitching on both of these flaps. So I did them separately because I really wanted the dark green thread to be on this one. So I didn't do it all in one sew. I first did this one with the mint green on the top and the Christmas pine on the bottom and I actually just stitched I started here 
at that join and I ended here. And then I never traveled around the corner because that's actually a little bit tricky anyway. And then I switched to my light colored thread and stitched all the way around here. And wow, I'm really happy with that. It looks great. And we just need to do a few more final things. We're gonna pull out the lining, that opening, and we can now stitch across here, finish that up, and then we'll tuck it back in. And then the other thing I'm gonna do is give it a really good final press. And for that, I have a few things that I like to use. I have this thing here, it's called a ham. So you can put something like that inside your bag if it fits. Looks like it just fits in there. And you can press out with um, a mini iron. I have a mini iron as well. I love my little mini irons. Or you can put a little mini iron like right inside there. Or I also like to use my sleeve board. So this is for pressing shirt sleeves and it works really nice as well. You can do it like that. So press out everything really nicely and then you're finished your bag. Let's see. That looks really good. We're ready to clip our strap on. So like this. Make sure it's not twisted. And there we go, there's our finished bag. I love it. That was a lot of fun actually, and the sewing part is super fast. I'm gonna finish my vinyl one now so I can post some photos of it too. Thanks for sewing with me today. It was a lot of fun. If you have any questions, just contact us at service at And remember to follow our channel and watch for new videos and tutorials.